friends and family, in the fullness of God's grace and in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we are gathered this afternoon to thank God for and to celebrate the life of Philip Nile Metcalf. On behalf of Phil's family, we are very grateful for your presence in the service today. I'm Anne Hatfield, one of the pastors here at Westminster, and it is a privilege to join this gathering of family and friends with hearts full of gratitude for this very dear man. We join our thoughts today to celebrate Phil's life, to lift our voices in praise of God who gave him to us, and to rejoice at the difference Phil made in God's good world as a son, a brother, a husband, a father, a grandfather, as a compassionate pastor, a dedicated teacher, a friend to many, a beloved child of God, and as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. And while this is a time of sadness for those who knew and loved Phil, this also is an opportunity for us to reflect on his days and to give thanks for the gift of his long and full life. It is a time for us to experience comfort in community and to find hope, hope in God's love. As we gather for this service, we also bear witness to the promise of the resurrection. As people of faith, we trust Phil is now at peace. He has passed beyond death, and he has entered into a new eternal life in the fullness of God's light, peace, and joy. So we come this day in thanksgiving and worship in tribute to Phil, but even more in tribute to the one, our holy God, who gave Phil to us. In keeping with Phil's strong and abiding uh, faith in God, let us begin this memorial service with words from Scripture. The psalmist declares, Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. And the apostle Paul wrote, If we live, we live unto the Lord, and if we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Trusting in the name of the Lord and the mercy of God our Creator, will you pray with me? Great and gracious God, we come to you this day with thanksgiving for Phil's life, a life well lived and lived to its fullness. We hold a mixture of thoughts and feelings as we remember and celebrate his life, but also grieve his death. We thank you for giving him to us to know and to love. In your boundless compassion, console us as we mourn. O oh God, we trust our farewell is not forever, because we know Phil is held in your eternal embrace. So speak to us, Lord, in scripture, prayer, tribute, and music, but even more by your presence here in our midst. May we be reminded again of the good news of resurrection and the promise that we too will one day be raised to join Phil and all the saints in communion with you. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Phil indeed had a deep and abiding faith in God, and the way that he lived his life demonstrated his love of God, along with his trust in God's guiding presence through all of his days. Phil trusted God to be his vision and his wisdom throughout his life. So please stand as you are able in body and spirit as we sing our opening hymn, Be Thou My Vision.
This time of confession is an opportunity for us to acknowledge the times when we fall short and we miss the mark of who God calls us to be. But we also know that we come before a God who is merciful and forgiving. So trusting in God's extravagant grace, let us confess the things that separate us from God and from one another. Will you please join me in our unison prayer of confession as you'll find it in your order of service. Let us pray. Gracious God, you see us as we are and know our inmost thoughts. We confess that we often take life for granted. We forget that all life comes from you and that to you all life returns. We have not always lived as your grateful people nor loved as Christ loved us. Forgive us, Lord. Remind us that your grace alone sustains us. Free us, heal us, and make us whole, that we might be restored to the joy of your salvation now and forever. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. As far as the east is from the west, so far are our sins removed from us. Know that in Christ we are redeemed, renewed, and restored. Be assured of God's grace and pardon, and be at peace. Amen. We uh, have an opportunity now to uh, remember and to reinforce uh, Phil's love of Scripture. He was a beloved child of God, but also a pastor. And as he served three congregations, he found guidance and direction in his leadership role through Scripture. So remembering his love of God's Word, we are going to hear the first of our two Scripture passages read by Phil's granddaughter, Sullivan. From 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 53 through 58, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with the more immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your label, labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now to the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. And now we come to a time of tributes of remembrance, and before we hear from Phil's daughters, uh, we want to offer an opportunity for Peter Clark to come forward and give greetings from his congregation. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ, and from the Royers Ford Church of the Nazarene, uh, where 41 years ago, uh, 41 years ago, on his last year of ministry service, uh, Pastor Phil, for John Clark back there, dedicated uh, his son, me, um, at the Royce Ford Church of the Nazarene. Uh, I come on behalf of the church where I've served seven years. As Pastor Phil served the church seven years, I'm on sabbatical, but this is just too meaningful for me to miss. Edie and family, uh, Pastor Phil's ministered to me in ways, uh, it's, it's through the distance and other pastors in ways I, I can't even really express fully. But I come on behalf of a church who's so grateful. Pastor Phil was a monument 
in the memory of our church. His legacy includes stuff and accomplishments, but people. My parents got connected to the Rose Ford Church of the Nazarene because of Pastor Phil. And our current membership in many ways is attributed to the way he and his associate pastors reached out. Um, he deserves credit for that because he did a really good job. The building he built uh, as a community center kind of, he was seeing years ahead um, with the leadership that was there. That building is still our main mode of outreach in the church. Uh, that's the way we meet families for Jesus Christ in our town. And on top of that, all the classrooms downstairs that were classrooms for have become uh, all set up with free food and free clothing that people come in constantly uh, to come and get. Uh, Pastor Phil set us up in our church for uh, a change in culture, and uh, we're just really grateful for his foresight and the way that he honored God. Um, he represented God's well, God well. He, he ministered to me personally a couple of times. He helped me bury my mother-in-law as part of the church because she was part of the church and it was just so tender. And it meant a lot to me for him to do that. I called Pastor Phil a couple times as pastor, and I can tell you this, he never condescended to me. This little 30-year-old kid trying to run a church, he treated me with, with such respect as a pastor. And I was so grateful to that personally. When I think about Pastor Phil, and I've heard him preach and, and lead remembrances many times, what I think about him is that he elevated the thinking and the heart and the spirituality towards the place where the Lord is. And every opportunity that he was given the mic and the pulpit and leadership. But there's that phrase that, you know, be too, too heavenly high to be of any earthly good. That was not Pastor Phil. He lived his life really well. My sense is that he loved his family really well, even in the life choices that he made. Um, on behalf of the church, on behalf of the, my very limited knowledge of him personally, um, but one who experiences the fruits of his faithfulness, I'd say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And on top of that, I would say, well done, thou good and faithful leader of God's people into God's likeness. Thank you for giving me the chance to share. God bless you. And now we'll hear first from Yvonne and then from Madonna. As I was putting together my thoughts for today, I was watching a video from my parents' 50th wedding anniversary celebration over 10 years ago. And my dad spent a moment to welcome everyone. And I found his words very fitting for today and reflective how we, as his family, feel by the overwhelming response of all of you in this room online, and by the number of cards that have been received. His welcome went something like this. We are so grateful that our lives have been interwoven, some more than others. There's only a few that have known us the whole 50. I think I could count them maybe on one hand. Whether that is true, or if you've known us for 40, 30, 20, or whatever, I want you to know how grateful we are that our lives have been interwoven. We've had the privilege of partnering with you along the way. We've had the privilege of some of us working in church life together, others in business life. There's been the sharing of work and leisure. We have interwoven our lives with tears and laughter as well. And so it is just the highest honor that you have taken time out of your busy season to come both near and far, some across the road, others across the country. I can't tell you how overwhelmed we are at that thought, so we want to welcome you. It is momentous occasions like those that allow us to reflect back and cherish the words, the moments, and the time spent together. Just recently, here in June, we celebrated Mom and Dad's 60th anniversary. After a delicious dinner at Kimberton Inn, we went back to their house and settled in around the fireplace. As a family, we then presented them with an album of over 400 photos, highlighting their journey from their wedding day all the way up to their Diamond Jubilee. We spent the next two hours going page by page 
photo by photo, laughing and reminiscing, all while learning some of the stories behind some of those older photos. For me, I will cherish that moment forever. So many people over the years have had the opportunity in one way or another to experience my dad's kindness, generosity, love, and commitment to serve others. It's by God's grace that each of us here today can reflect on those memories, whether they included an encouraging word, a prayer, or just a funny story. I invite each of you to cherish those moments you have had with my dad, just as I will. God bless my dad with an extraordinary ability to see, read, or hear something, and then transform it into something beautiful, whether written or spoken. I bet if you asked him, he could even take the ingredients off a cereal box and turn them into a great story. As you may or may not know, my dad served as a pastor for many years. This exceptional ability was definitely something that came through in his sermons. I can remember sitting in the church pew on Sundays, listening intently to his words, watching his mannerisms, hearing the passion in his voice as he delivered God's word. I loved listening to my dad preach. Reflecting on that time now, I envision as dad entered Christ's holy presence, the words comforting me. Matthew 25, 21. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling the small amount, so now I will give you more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Today, let's celebrate the devotion, faithfulness, and kindness my poppy has given to this life and to the one God has prepared for him in heaven. Thank you. PJ, I was the babysitter when you were born. <laughs> it's so good to see you here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> PJ. <laughs> okay, I want to start with my mom's request, a poem by Robert Browning. I walked a mile with pleasure, she chattered all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and ne'er a word said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. My dad retired on April 1st, 2008, and for a long time after that, he would run into friends or anyone who asked him, how's retirement going? Dad's response was, today is the 310th day, or whatever day it was, of retirement. So far, so good. And with a grin, but who's counting? A little more time passed, and when he discovered days were long and he wasn't quite ready for the porch rocking chair, he started a new job driving an activity bus. That meant school sporting events and field trips for Wolfington bus lines. He started adding those days to his list. He would say he was retired for 723 days, but now driving the bus for 246 days. But who's counting? I think when he finally retired from Wolfington in 2017, he didn't quite keep up so closely with the retired days, but he could still come up with the number if you asked. Dad could be difficult to summarize, as most of us probably are. He was very dynamic and complex in his background. From farm boy to college, then graduate school, pastor and congregational shepherd to successful businessman. But when we could take just a minute to sit with him, he was very simple to understand. He was a man of faith. He had a heart of humility, and just being in his presence was comforting. He was a great listener and offered great fatherly advice and was always supportive. 
I'm speaking today to share and celebrate with you the life that my dad, Phil Metcalf, lived so well. He lived a good life. He was a good man. I'll also look over the life of my dad through examples, both my own memories and the memories that many of you have shared with us too, and I think we'll see the common strength, the strand of DNA that made him who he was, consistently who he was, a teacher. I watched and I learned from him. I learned the how-tos of life, the how-tos of parenting, the how-tos of marriage, for example, my dad taught me how to compromise in marriage. When my parents lived in Westchester, they had a cat named Deuteronomy, Deuter for short. Well, Deuter got old and died, and before they moved to their present home in Kimberton, Mom mentioned that she wanted another cat. Dad did not want another cat. They compromised. They got two cats. <laughs> compromise. For my dad, that meant choose your battles. You can't die on every hill. That has proven itself an excellent principle to live by. I've spent both quantity and quality time with my mother driving back and forth over the last six weeks of dad's life to the hospital, then rehab centers, often feeling like the third wheel, but also fully appreciating the view and front row seat of my parents' very successful relationship. It was a partnership. There's a palpable love between them, a love that has proven to be an enduring commitment, unconquerable by time, and as Yvonne said, for over 60 years. One of my most favorable men memories was at Bryn Mawr Rehab just a few weeks ago. Mom and I would visit faithfully every evening, visiting hours from four to eight, two people per day. That's very different than two people at a time. That takes planning. So sometimes I would forgo my visit in exchange for one of my girls to be able to visit their pop. He lit up when he saw the girls, and equally they lit up when they saw him. Their lives were interwoven through and through. Anyway, one afternoon, following a full day of physical and occupational therapy, I volunteered to push him down the hall in his customized wheelchair to go to the cafe for a bag of chips and a change of scenery. Mom was walking beside him, holding his hand. Can you picture that? I was pushing. Mom was walking beside, holding hands. I will carry that beautiful picture with me the rest of my days. My dad loved my mom, and that love was returned to him. Mom loved dad. While making phone calls to many of you, you have shared your memories of how Phil Metcalf has influenced your lives. From your stories, I know that many of you would also describe him as a teacher. You've shared moments from your most meaningful lessons that dad has taught from the pulpit or Sunday school classroom or lessons you learned from him through lived experiences, as I often did. I have tuned in to your stories, recollecting his detail-oriented resolve to do the right thing. When others, even professionals, lawyers in one particular case, couldn't figure out a resolution to a stalemate, Phil Metcalf persevered with a laser focus. He went the extra mile and found a positive conclusion. As a leader, he keenly understood his accountable role and he took responsibility. Between what I know about dad and your shared experiences about dad, it all came into focus. The prime principle that Phil Metcalf lived, body, mind, and spirit, was a focus on living a faith-based, Christ-centered life and teaching others to do the same. While I was in graduate school, the best descri description I heard went like this. A teacher has knowledge and vision of where the student needs to go, but must also know the student and recognize the gaps in knowledge. A teacher fills those gaps to give the student what they need to get to the other side. A teacher provides a path for the student from the unknown to understanding. 
My mom shared with me the privilege of pouring through dad's files and collections of old sermons and messages. What a treasure. I'm sure many of you would remember the series on Jonah, the reluctant prophet, and the series on Jeremiah. And in fact, those that were paying attention now know that Jeremiah was not just a bullfrog. Dun, dun, dun. Gary Cochran shared on the phone just a few weeks ago the meaningful message that he'll always remember from Dad's sports series, Running the Good Race. Personally, I'll never forget the series on the attributes of God. We were given a way or a path to understanding our Creator. We studied the omnipotence of God and the omnipresence of God, attributes only God himself possesses. But my favorite attribute to study, of course, was the goodness of God. In understanding who God is, we are grateful that God is not only good at being God, like Michael Jordan at basketball, but that he's a good God as well, like a loving father. That's good enough to say again. God is not only good at being God, he's a good God as well. Dad spent time in study, filling his inquiring mind for truth. He knew people by building trust and enjoying relationship with them and had a vision of where people needed to go in knowledge. He recognized the gaps. And by the grace of God, very capably and competently filled those gaps. Phil Metcalf believed in the truth, the message of God, and the salvation of Christ, and he loved sharing that path of truth with others. Phil Metcalf, by design, a teacher. It's in his DNA. As our dad, he had a vision of where we needed to go. He's a man who's taught us everything from table manners to tying shoes how to drive, how to drive stick, that makes him also a very patient man, how to show you care about people, how to treat your friends, how to be a family man, as well as one of life's hardest lessons, how to find God's grace in the death of their daughter and our sister. Dad has been a living example of the things he taught all of us, not only how to, but how to with grace, dignity, love and compassion. He filled the gaps. We as a family have been completely leaning on our faith these days. We have walked a mile with sorrow. We're riding a roller coaster of our human mental emotions, battling moments of penetrating grief, in between moments of finding spiritual comfort in our belief and faith in the promises of Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life the very conqueror of death, amen. As I mentioned, death is not new to my family. We lost my sister Jill over 26 years ago, and we find comfort and peace now knowing that dad is together with Jill, and they are both whole and in his presence. The gentle peace of Jesus that surpasses understanding is surrounding us. Robert Browning's poem is beautiful and deeply descriptive of our grief, but for my family, and maybe you, he's missing a final verse. I've walked a mile with pleasure, she chattered all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and ne'er a word said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. The final verse should go something like this. I've walked a mile with Phil Metcalf, a teacher, and I've found by God's grace there is hope. In everything, give thanks is the lesson we're learning to do as a family these days. So in closing, I simply want to express thanksgiving to the larger community, the context in which our lives are lived. To those of you who've come to stand by us today for all of your expressions of love, whether by cards, flowers, personal visits, or affirmation that you were praying for dad or us, we sense it and we're deeply moved by it. Those prayers were heard and answered as these last six weeks with dad were priceless and deeply meaningful to us as a family. I've shared with countless nursing students that it is a privilege of nursing 
It is a privilege of being human to share the walk to the edge of eternity with a dying patient. I did not recognize that we were on that walk with Dad. I think too often we miss opportunities, but I'm so grateful we were given the time. God is good. Finally, I want to thank God for giving us a father and pop like Phil Metcalf. It's wonderful to look at the things God does for us, things we had no decision in at all. We are debtors to God's grace. When we stop to reflect on the way things could have been to have been fathered to someone who cared little about the values of family or to have been fathered by someone who cared little about the things of God is to understand the depth of our indebtedness to grace. Once again, I am so grateful that God gave us some quality time to spend with Dad these last six weeks, holding hands, praying together, and exchanging our hugs and expressions of love to him. Thank you, Lord. Dad was not only good at being Dad, he was a good dad. It is a good day today to be a child of God, it is also good to be a child of Phil Metcalf. For the record, and if you're wondering, Dad celebrated 5,272 days of retirement. Today is day number 20 of Dad's eternal celebration of heaven. But who's counting? Humanly, we would have liked for him to stay with us another 20 years or more. I think I could have learned a lot more. But as a family, we yield today to our good and loving Father's plans for him, committing Dad to his healing embrace, and closing in Phil Metcalf's own words of faith, knowing that he's too good to be unkind and too wise to ever make a mistake. Thank you both to Yvonne and to Madonna for sharing your thoughts about your beloved dad. Phil was a lifelong learner, and you also heard that his faith was such a strong part of who he was as a person and as a follower of Christ. So we have an opportunity in our service today to use an affirmation of faith to state what it is that Phil believed and what he invites all of us to believe as Christians. So I would encourage you now to stand in body and spirit as you are able, and we will read this responsive reading uh, from a declaration of faith. Let us stand. Death often seems to prove that life is not worth living, that our best efforts and deepest affections go for nothing. We do not yet see the end of death, but Christ has been raised from the dead, transformed and yet the same person. In his resurrection is the promise of ours. We are convinced the life God wills for each of us is stronger than the death that destroys us. The glory of that life exceeds our imagination, but we know we shall be with Christ. So we treat death as a broken power. Its ultimate defeat is certain. In the face of death we grieve, yet we hope and celebrate life. No life ends so tragically that its meaning and value are destroyed. Nothing, not even death, can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Please be seated. And listen as John Frost sings of the power of Christ that Phil knew so well and lived out throughout his life. Oh, mm-hmm. 
Now, let me invite um, Kendall to come forward and read our gospel lesson for today. From the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 17 to 27. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been there, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. As people who knew and loved Phil, we gather in community to mourn our loss but also to celebrate his full and fruitful life. As you have heard from the tributes of remembrance, to have known Phil is to be deeply grateful for the joy of his company. To know Phil will always mean being blessed and influenced by his loving, selfless, and caring example. 
Today we give thanks for this remarkable and inspiring man who is deeply loved and will be greatly missed by many people. Some of you knew Phil as a dedicated pastor like P PC, PC. Um, others as a hardworking and reliable insurance, insurance agent, and some as a Sunday school teacher, many of you as a caring and loyal friend. And whether it was in ministry work or daily living, knowing Phil meant encountering a kind, thoughtful, gentle man, a true gentleman. As one of the pastors at Westminster, where Edie and Phil have been members for nearly 20 years, I had the privilege of knowing Phil as a faithful worshiper and active member of our congregation. Week in and week out, but I mean, who was counting the days? It always was a great pleasure to greet Phil and Edie in worship. With a warm smile and a twinkle in his eye, Phil expressed his gratitude for the sermons, prayers, and music. Over and over again, as Phil exited the sanctuary, he was encouraging, thankful, and gracious in acknowledging the joyful message, the good news that he was carrying with him as he headed out into the world. I visited Phil the week before he died, and I'm grateful I had that opportunity to be with him, to sit with him one more time. And even while he was at Bryn Mawr Rehab, recovering from surgery, Phil was thinking about ways to get more involved in the life of our congregation and in service to Christ his Lord. Phil was a lifelong learner, who was always striving to be a more faithful follower of Jesus. So listen again to these words from Philippians, which Sullivan read earlier. The Apostle Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but by everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Joy, gentleness, truth, honor, justice, praise, peace, these are all words Phil embodied during his lifetime. And as we reflect on the way Phil lived his life, it becomes apparent that his life was not so much about Phil as it was about those whose lives he could improve and enrich. He was the type of person who did not count himself at the center of the universe. Rather, he consistently made helping and caring and supporting others a priority at all times. What a remarkable testimony of faith. To live life fully, to pour yourself out, to wonder at its joy and beauty, to do your best, and in the end, with gratitude, to be at peace. The peace that passes all understanding. The depth and strength of Phil's faith is also captured in the other two scripture passages read today. The Apostle Paul shares with the church in Corinth the meaning of Jesus' resurrection, namely, that death has been swallowed up in victory through Jesus Christ. And in John's Gospel account, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? 
Certainly, Phil's answer was, yes, I believe. Perhaps the clearest witness of Phil's faith was offered in the words he shared at the death of their daughter, Jill Heather Metcalf, in 1996. In his tribute to his beloved daughter, Phil wrote this. Today, we joyfully, joyfully affirm our faith that Jill, for Jill to die is to gain, and that she is now whole and with God. Today, we joyfully affirm our faith that for Jill to die is gain, and that she is now whole and with God. Our Christian faith assures us death does not have the final word. In the promise of Christ's resurrection, these mortal bodies put on immortality and the, in the abiding presence of our gracious God, they are immortal spiritual bodies. So today we joyfully proclaim that both Jill and Phil are made whole and they are with God together. As we express our deep appreciation for Phil, let us all treasure the special and unique ways he touched and influenced our lives. Phil was, as you have heard, a wonderful person, intelligent, generous, hardworking, and kind. So let us cherish the memories that we have shared today, and especially remember and give thanks for Phil's willingness to be an instrument of God's grace. As he lived out his faith on a daily basis, he was a truly good man. Friends, indeed, our grief is real and deep and painful. But we grieve with hope in the promises of Scripture and in the comfort of this community. And as we say goodbye, we also keep hold of the many wonderful memories that we have of Phil. We can celebrate the gift of his life, knowing he deeply touched the lives of so many people, especially as a pastor, a teacher, and a friend. And we can rejoice that his life is one full of happiness, more often than sadness, and health, more than sickness. So friends, may God bless the memories of Phil to our hearts and minds, and may we find gratitude in knowing Phil has indeed found rest and peace in the abiding presence and steadfast love of our holy God, who, as others have already said, surely has welcomed Phil home, saying, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. Throughout his days, and who's counting, but he trusted in God as his good shepherd. So will you join me using the ancient words of Psalm 23, which speaks of the confidence of God in all parts of our lives. Let us join in the reading of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. And now let us join our hearts and minds in a time of prayer. Holy God, our loss is great this day. And yet even in the midst of our sorrow, we find gratitude in our hearts, for you have blessed us so abundantly in the remarkable gift of knowing and loving Phil. Give comfort to us as we grieve his death. 
but also lift our spirits as we celebrate his deep and abiding faith and give thanks for his full and wonderful life. We thank you for all that he was and all that he meant in the world and to each of us. We are grateful, O God, for the witness of Phil's living, for his devotion to family and friends, and for his desire to serve, support, and care for others. Thank you for his quiet nature that made him such a wonderful listener and for his loving heart that enabled him to excel in patience and forgiveness. Gracious God, in our remembrance of Phil, we thank you for his ability to face the challenges and changes of life with grace and courage. We are grateful for his shepherding gifts as a pastor and generosity in helping and teaching others. Thank you for his inner strength, his gentle spirit, and his trust in you as his Lord and Savior. And we celebrate Phil's love of his family. We are grateful for the 60-year marriage he shared with Edie as they enjoyed their partnership at home as well as at work. We lift up to you Phil's family, Edie, Yvonne, Madonna, Sullivan, and Kendall, and all the other people Phil held closest to his heart. As they experience his loss in their lives, grant them your steadfast love, comfort, and peace. Oh God, it is difficult to say goodbye. But as we do, we also keep hold of the many wonderful memories we have of this dear and good man. And we take comfort in knowing that for him, there is no longer sickness or sadness. You have welcomed Phil into a new heavenly home, a dwelling place in which there is no more darkness, no more pain, no more tears, but only the joy, light, and peace of your abiding company. By your grace, bless us with the confidence that Phil knew that nothing in this world or the next, not even death, can separate us from your love that Phil knew in Jesus Christ our Lord, the one who taught us to join our voices together, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God claimed Phil in his baptism and claims him again in his death. Phil trusted in God who loved him from his first cry until his final breath. So please stand as you are able in body and spirit as we sing our closing hymn, I was there to hear your morning cry. I was there. 
As we come to the close of this service, you are invited to join Phil's family for a reception in our fellowship hall just at the back, out the back doors and, and down the hallway where you'll be able to greet the family. Friends, Phil has indeed been made whole. And to honor his life and faith, let us go out into the world following the example that Phil set before us. And as we go, may we go with this benediction. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to what is good. Render no one evil for evil. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all persons. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.